Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Dot. Um. <laughs> Today, I am speaking with Darcy Weir, the documentarian of Sasquatch Among the Wildmen, uh, a fascinating documentary about Bigfoot, the Yeti, the Yearin, and all sorts of different wild hairy men throughout the history of humanity and possibly lost species that might be found if, uh, if we actually come across them. Darcy, how are you today? Good. How are you doing, Darcy? Uh, happy to be here. Uh, this was a fun documentary. Um, I have to ask the question right off the bat. Sure. Technology has advanced to where we have 4K cameras that we can make movies off our telephones. Why can't we get a decent picture of Bigfoot from the hunters that claim they found, uh, they found him? Um, well, you know, somebody asked me recently if, uh, if, we have satellite technology why we can't get a really good picture from you know high up above either and my answer to that is you know even if you're the best cameraman in the world if your subject is super far away um, from your camera lens you're not going to get a very good quality video and from all the accounts that i've heard of recent encounters with these possible um, wild men or, or relic hominids is what we call them in the documentary. Um, they're usually pretty far away, you know, and, and unless you got like a telephoto lens and you know, maybe a high powered DSLR, you're not gonna be able to focus in on the subject and get a really good video in 4K pretty quickly. Um, an iPhone camera is great, but you know, up until four feet. That's why everybody uses them for selfies and you know, recording videos like this at home that they'll post online in like a couple of minutes, right? But if you're gonna be on an expedition, you're in the forest, lighting is not perfect, um, and you know, you don't have a steady hand and you're taking out your phone and recording what you can at the time you're probably gonna get some grainy video that looks interesting, but we're not 100% sure what we're seeing uh, in that video. And I think in this documentary, we do have some examples of that. We have some clips of what look like hominids that people have described seeing in the wild. Um, you know, that of Sasquatch or the Yaren or, uh, the Yeti, as you described before, I think we, we go over one uh, that we think might be an Olmisty, which is like a Russian um, relic hominid. Um, and yeah, so that's that's my answer. Um, the Yirin and the Olmisty are the two that seem the most feasible and realistic uh, for this ideal, for this uh, cryptozoology uh, or cryptozoic creature, um, because they're within six, six and a half feet tall, and we have quite a few, you know, people on the planet that are average between six and six five, which seems a lot more realistic than the Sasquatch that's supposed to be seven to nine feet tall. How can you miss something that's nine feet tall? After all, um, what created your fascination? with these uh, hairy men, for a lack of a better term, and what made you want to do a documentary about this subject? Um, to be honest, I've always been attracted to uh, the idea of UFOs and uh, ETs, or uh, secret secrets being kept from the public about possible visitation from an extraterrestrial race or races. Um, and I had made my first documentary back in 2012, uh, focusing on, you know, some of that content, some of that subject matter. And I always thought that Bigfoot or Sasquatch was a ridiculous notion. I mean, 
when you say the very name Bigfoot or Sasquatch, it sounds singular. It sounds like um, one creature or cryptid is what the uh, scientific name for this type of being is, living in the wild, running around, right? And um, people are like, why are there sightings out in Virginia? Why are there sightings in North Carolina? Why are there sightings in British Columbia, Canada? Why are there sightings in Northern California, Washington State? Well, that's because it's not just one creature. And I learned all this back in pretty much 2015. Sat down with uh, Bill Miller and uh, another gentleman, Thomas Steenberg, in a city or town that's about an hour and a half to two hours north of Vancouver, British Columbia, which is where I'm from. Um, and I was like, here we go. This is gonna be some crazy stuff these guys are saying, and I'm probably gonna to have to hold back laughing the whole time. But lo and behold, these gentlemen laid out some very credible data. They laid out stuff that seemed scientific to me. Um, for example, when you say that you see something and then that something leaves trace evidence behind at the scene of the crime, so to speak, um, and then people are able to analyze that data, trace evidence being footprints in this case. And, you know, Jeff Meldrum, I, I feature in my documentary, uh, Sasquatch Among Wild Men, and another documentary that I did in the past, called uh, The Unwanted Sasquatch. Um, he talks about the foot pathology of many of the prints that have been found historically throughout North America and internationally. He talked in this documentary about the Yaren footprints, which pretty much match that of the Sasquatch. Um, you know, averaging between 18 to 16 inches long, sometimes eight inches wide. I don't know any human beings that have feet like that. Do you? Other than Shaq, no. I don't even think his feet are eight inches wide. Right. They might be, they might get close to that length. But anyways, um, provided that we do have uh, a tribe of Shaquille O'Neal's living in deep wilderness across you know, the world really is what the hypothesis is. And in deep wilderness, there are places where we have not fully explored. Um, and globalization and our human spread, the way that we're adapting to this planet and constantly pushing out into the periphery of uh, the forests around the world, we're starting to get glimpses of what I think are still living relic hominids existing today in the forest. And sometimes they come across us, we come across them. It's kind of a see you later situation, you know? Um, I don't think they wanna get to know us. Humans are violent creatures and maybe they are too, I don't know. But um, yeah, that's, that's how I, I mean, in a nutshell, that's how I got into this. And I didn't really believe it. But when I saw all of the relevant data, I mean, Jeff Meldrum had recorded sightings that were found in parts of California. And when they go to these sighting areas, they find a few footprints by the logging road, okay? And then they go and follow those footprints that go into the forest. And they go into the forest for 500 steps or miles. Now, if you were to hoax this, I don't think you'd go that far. You'd probably put a few footprints by the road, a couple into the bush, they disappear, ha ah, All right, gig, gig is up. I put some stompers on and I made it look like this was real. But no, people, say that they're incredibly startled when they see these things. Uh, they say they have a common description of what they, the features of this creature are, the anatomy. Some say cone-shaped head, extremely tall, 
hairy, you know, thick, dark black fur or hair, kind of like a bear. But they're standing on two feet, they're bipeds. They have what looks like a ape-like face. And they look extremely muscular and they're fast. You know, if people see them, they say that they're gone in the woods within seconds. They move very fast for something of that size, you know. We're thinking Tyson Fury with some uh, some heavily furred up. And, uh, and yeah, I, I think, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. If people are going to have this many accounts around the world, then there must be something to it. Now, what was the aha moment for you that you said, okay, I'm a believer in all this, you know, because you've been, you've been following this for a while. You've had the fascination with cryptozoology and with these hominids. And then you've made a couple of documentaries, but there has to be a moment where you sit there and there's your conversion moment, you know, your St. Paul on the road to Damascus moment. What was that sure. for you? Okay, um, you know, I gotta say that when I went to this area, Harrison Hot Springs in British Columbia, and I met with Bill Miller and Thomas Steenberg, um, they showed me some footprint casts that were from the famous uh, film footage of uh, Patterson Gimlin film, shot in 1967, well before Chewie was created in Star Wars and, you know, all that jazz. Basically, they laid out the football pathology of that, those prints that they were showing me in person. And I was like, wow, yeah, like when you got it in your hands and uh, you're seeing what looks like dermal ridges and, you know, that can be described as, uh, you know, if you get calluses on your hands or on, on the tips of your fingerprints, people always print your your fingers if you're being checked out by a law. Um, those are dermal ridges. And you can see traces of that on the footprint cast sometimes. The, the plaster is so well cast that it, it actually lays out these little lines in the skin on the, on the cast. Um, so, you know, somebody was to make a fake footprint, they're going through a lot of effort to fake that type of thing. But you know, what really was the aha moment was when I traveled out to Jeff Meldrum's lab in Idaho at uh, Pocadello, Pocadello uh, Idaho State University. So you saw that probably in, in this documentary, whenever I'm interviewing him, behind him in, in many different shots are different shots of his lab. He's a anthropology, university teacher. Um, he's been doing this for a long time and he actually studied the locomotion earlier in his career of primates, comparing that to everything else that walks around and moves. So he's pretty, you know, well versed in what's human, what's not, what's ape, what's gorilla, what's chimpanzee, whatever, right? And He's thoroughly convinced that these hominids exist. And, uh, you know, if you go around his laboratory, he's got over 300 footcasts from different sightings from around the world. And his name again was? Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. Meldrum. Jeffrey Meldrum, okay, at uh, Idaho State. Yes. Okay. Um, with all of this, you know, what cultures seem to be the most receptive to the idea of these hominids? I mean, you know, in the United States, we'll look at some people and go, you know, Bigfoot hunters and call them crackpots or just, um, you know, people that like to go camping and get funded to go camping. Um, you know, China, you, again, you mentioned the year in, and we talked about the Yeti and, and in Russia. Um, which, which cultures seem the most receptive to this going, oh, yeah, they're out there in the wilderness. No, I've seen one or my uncle saw one. And they're more willing to believe they exist and the most skeptical cultures that you've come across, because this is an international phenomenon. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say there's definitely crackpots out there. There's people that are 
attracting attention to something that should be otherwise not attracted to. Um, they're, they're just making things up. And we cover that, you know, in, in the documentary, there was even a man that was killed by dressing up in a suit and getting hit by a car um, alongside a highway, just trying to hoax. Um, but here's the thing. You know, I've even heard Joe Rogan on his podcast say, you know, I believe in Bigfoot. And then another podcast will say, I don't believe in it, man. Come on. It's got to be bullshit. It, it's probably mostly just white people uh, in some kind of weird cult that are following this uh, elusive creature they think that exists out there. But the thing is, there are so many cultures out there, like you said. The Chinese believe in their wild men. They even have a state park uh, in the middle of one of their national forests deep in China, in, in the mountains, that they dedicate monuments to their wild men, the Yeren. Um, and we, we show that in the documentary. And then, you know, the indigenous people of North America and other indigenous peoples around the world, you know, even if you go if you go to some native Canadian tribes, the Stehalis in British Columbia, in their totem pole, they have the uh, Zunaqua, you know, which is their name, or they have the Sasquet. J.W. Burns was an English teacher. He created the name Sasquatch because he didn't actually know how to properly pronounce back in the 1920s um, the word Sas Sasquet. And um, there, if you look at all the different native tribes across North America, there's Skookum is another name for it from another native uh, American tribe. And they basically taught their kids when, when they were living on this content without Europeans and uh, before this content was taken over by us, they taught their families to not go deep into the forest alone, always be in groups, because the Zunaqua or the Sasquet or the Skookum will get the children. And, you know, we see this type of primate behavior in apes. They steal the young from other tribes and eat them even all the time. So it, it doesn't really surprise me if that was something to worry about, um, if that is primate behavior. But uh, yeah, the indigenous peoples of North America, if you want to look at their tales of uh, a Sasquatch type being that has lived in the wilderness alongside man since the dawn of time, they're a place to go and find that out. With your documentary, you take a more scientific approach. Um, I had joked, and I had talked to, to um, you know, the guys at Prometheus that do Ancient Aliens, that uh, I, I claimed they were following me and listening to my conversations, because my friend and I had joked one time, the reason why we can't find Bigfoot is that he uses wormholes to get around, and that's why he's so elusive. And then three months later, ended up on an, on an episode of Ancient Aliens. Um, are there theories that go that extreme that you've come across that you're just like, this is too far fetched. This doesn't belong in my documentary or was, did you listen to every theory that came your way and then decided to go the more scientific route and saying, this is a possibility of a species because we were told the giant, the giant squid was extinct. And then we found one that was what, 23 feet long or 24 feet long, something, you know, some ridiculous length of these creatures. Yeah, so um, I actually cover the Sasquatch stepping out of wormholes theory uh, briefly in another documentary I did called The Unwanted Sasquatch, which was released back in 2016. I don't think you can see it right now because we're re-releasing it as a director's cut uh, at the beginning of 2021. Um, but basically, it, it's old hat, that theory. Um, I, I believe that theory, look, I don't want to shoot people down for their beliefs. People, people can believe whatever they want, but I believe there's more evidence to the relic 
hominid theory than there is to wormhole Bigfoot. And um, I'm not, you know, I told you before, I believe in UFOs and possible suppression of extraterrestrial visitation. Okay. I'm not crazy, but I don't know if Bigfoot would be really some kind of extra di dimensional alien being, you know, um, that's kind of ridiculous in, in my eyes. Um, and, you know, my last documentary, Bill Merrill, he famously claimed that theory. Back in the 1970s and 80s, there was kind of a emergence of this, you know, hippy dippy uh, sort of alien beliefs where, you know, Bigfoot is this um, omnipotent and peaceful creature that jumps out of dimensions and yada, yada, yada. I, I don't find any relevant uh, Evidence of that, I think it's just people jumping on the bandwagon and causing sensationalism towards a subject that does have some credibility without it. Yeah, the cryptozoology, ancient astronaut theorists, it's, a, it's an interesting community. I've been to AlienCon, I've been to Contact in the Desert, and Contact in the Desert had two very distinct camps the year that I went, when it was still actually in the desert. Um, there were the people that were there for what they called alternative science. And then there were people that were there just to smoke peyote in the desert. How are you there to distinguish between the two camps uh, when making a documentary like this uh, for the scientist camp and then for the people that just want to have fun and do their hallucinogenics? I mean... I'm in the Jeff Meldrum camp, the Grover Kranz camp, you know, the, the Olympic project camp, which Shane Corson, uh, David Ellis, and uh, Derek Randalls are a part of. And in this documentary, I interview them and their encounters they've had, first, first person, their, their uh, encounters they've had individually, and also the data that they're collecting, you know, supposed uh, nests sort of nesting ground that they've found in uh, deep wilderness in Washington state. And I, I respect anybody who wants to look at theories outside of the box. You know, a lot of things are shunned and uh, dismissed by mainstream science because of uh, an already established paradigm that says, no, this does not exist. And it's a uphill battle, I believe, from there. Um, if you want to explore ideas like this uh, under the influence of peyote, fine, if that's what makes you comfortable. But I don't need to be you know, high to think this way. I, I've always thought outside of the box. I've always thought there's credibility to uh, subjects such as this and uh if if back in 2015 i had met with these individuals that said they have had encounters and they have all kinds of data to prove the existence of sasquatch or bigfoot um and i didn't believe them i wouldn't be making these documentaries um let's say for argument's sake um, you could only sit there and go, all right, there's Sasquatch, there's Yeti, there's the Yirin, there's the uh, Almasty in Russia. Um, of those four, and they said only one of them truly exists, and the others are just offshoot stories that expand the legend of one. Which of those four would you think would be the most accurate or the most realistic description that would still possibly exist today? Well, I think if you look at the history of encounters in um, North America. They date back, you know, to the times of Vikings uh, arriving on the shores of Canada and the United States. Annie did a Bigfoot special talking about, um, you know, Native Canadians and, and, and uh, Native Americans 
first meetings with these peoples and then how supposed Bigfoot were stealing fish out of Vikings nets at night. Um, but basically what I'm saying is there's a really long history, not only in Native Canadian and Native American tales of these creatures, but we also have eyewitness video photographic accounts that are very modern too. Not all of it's fake. Some of it may be real. And uh, I take stock in that. I think Sasquatch and, or its other name, Bigfoot, um, which are bad names because they sound like one creature, as I said before. The theory is that there are a population of these living in deep wilderness. I do think also in Russia, the Almasty or uh, the um, Yeti, the Russian Yeti has credibility too. Um, and if we look at the way the planet had that continental bridge connection with ice uh, way back when, um, you know, there's, there's relevant data there that bears, for example, that are exist in North America. They originated out of Asia. You know, in Asia, we have the sun bear and the Russians have all kinds of bears. They have basically Kodiak bears and polar type bears. And that's what we have in North America. That's because our continents were connected at one time and all sorts of animals were crossing that between the two. So the theory is that possibly some ancestor of Sasquatch, something like Gigantopithecus may have survived in Russia, China, you know, throughout Asia at one point. And they cross that bridge to North America that those creatures evolved and that's what we have here and what people state and claim that they see in Russia and China exist there and looks a little bit different but humans look a bit different too I don't look too Chinese do I no no human evolution is uh has created divides in what we look like um have scientists explained why there's you know the climate in Western Europe isn't too far off than some of the climates here in North America? Um, but I've what I've noticed from all the documentaries and all all the research that has come out is that this is primarily North America, Russia, and China. So the the northern hemisphere in this regard in the New World and the old, but nothing necessarily in Europe. Sub-Saharan Africa or or South America, um, is this based on climate? Is this based on uh, geographic travel where they just ended up because of the Bering Strait? They just stayed in the northern hemisphere. Uh, what are the reasons that they give that they haven't traveled into the southern hemisphere? Um, you know, there there is tales of relics, sort of hominids that were covered head to toe in and, and were quite tall uh, in places like Peru. We do have the elongated skulls that have been found there. And if you follow Brian Forrester, who's done an excellent job of actually analyzing all of those remains, um, you know, these skulls are quite large. They're not made through skull binding, which is, uh, you know, a technique of forming the shape of your, your sagittal crest, your, crust, your the uh, skull as you're developing as a baby. These are uh, fully formed cone-shaped heads and they were covered in red fur, red hair. Uh, you know, if you look at some of these skulls, they still have big clumps of red hair connected to scalp, which is still connected to the skull that survived all these years. It's incredible. And um, this red sort of fur looking hair uh, apparently completely covered their face, completely covered their bodies. Um, and these relic skulls from what I would assume are relic hominids 
existed thousands of years ago. Um, if you look at the popu population density compared to of humans compared to the wilderness that still exists, I think that is where you will see an extinction of certain species, right? Um, the dodo no longer exists in New Zealand and Australia. And, and you know, if, if we start to pro proliferate, certain species start to die off. And uh, wild men accounts were made in Europe, you know, by the, the Greeks spoke of wild men large, hairy, man-like beasts that, that lived in deep wilderness. But if you look at the population density in Europe, uh, in London, for example, I think it's, what is it, like 20 million people? Uh, in, in the UK, which is a relatively small land mass, it's 60 million people. So those days are gone for, for wild men to possibly exist there. Like you said, you still have tales of sightings in China, um, deep wilderness there, deep wilderness in Russia. I think there's more um, wilderness that is harder for us to access there that allows for these possible uh, relic hominids to exist still. In North America, you know, you go up northern Canada, there's relatively no one there. There's small cities, small towns, and there's deep, deep wilderness. The Arctic, deep wilderness. Um, there's uh, a gentleman, Survivor Man, right? Who had his show for a number of years, and he's come out and said he's had some strange encounters in Ar the Arctic area, the Arctic region, and Northern Alberta, he's investigated. Um, his name is escaping me. I think he's great. I'd love to talk to him sometime. But um, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Um, before I let you go, I know the documentary Sasquatch and the Wild Man, um, sorry, uh, Sasquatch Among the Wild Men comes out on VOD and DVD in um, November 10th. Uh, let's say, for the sake of, as you know, I, I'm fascinated by cryptozoology. So for the crowd like myself that's intrigued in cryptozoology and then the skeptics that would call this uh, crackpot theory or tinfoil hat theory, uh, why should both camps want to watch your documentary? Um, because I think it sheds some different information. You know, if you go watch um, shows like Finding Bigfoot, which I don't think are very honest attempts. I think they're just uh, comedy shows, for lack of a better word. word. They're bad reality TV that's rehearsed and, uh, and written by the producers and laid out so that it's, it follows a certain beat and makes people laugh and, and like the characters, the people, more than the, the research. I think my documentary doesn't obsess about the people. It obsesses about the research. And um, you, I invite skeptics to watch the documentary and to pick apart any scenario in that where they find it not credible. But uh, as we know, skeptics usually don't do their research. They usually are armchair analysts that attack the people, don't attack the research because they haven't been out in the field themselves. They haven't um, gone to Jeff Meldrum's lab in Idaho and gone over all the footprint casts and hair samples that have been collected, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Darcy Weir, thank you so much for your time today. Where can we find you in the documentary on social media if we want to connect? Um, I'm under Darcy Weir. Same name on Facebook and Instagram. Not very big on the Snapchats and all that stuff, but if you want to find me there and have a chat, I welcome it, a friendly guy. Uh, thanks for having me on RC and uh, yeah, look forward to chatting again sometime. Oh, thank you for talking to me. Darcy Weir, W-E-I-R when you look for it. Sasquatch Among the Wildmen comes on demand in DVD November 10th. 
uh, usual suspects for all your streaming services, YouTube, Xbox, uh, uh, Fandango Now, DirecTV, et cetera, et cetera. Check out the DVD as well. I'm sure there's some extra bonus features on there that we didn't get a chance to talk to. Uh, Darcy Weir focuses on the research in this documentary far more so than the, uh, than the music and the heart pumping aspects that a lot of the other shows do. Again, Darcy, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to chatting with you again for your next documentary. Cool. Thanks, Darcy. Take care. Take care, man.